So many controls. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome. Um, it's always a great pleasure to be able to start the, uh, or to announce the annual uh, Bernice Grafstein Lecture in Neuroscience. It's something that uh, uh, for some years now we've been able to run. Oh, thank you. For uh, our students and, and, and staff and faculty, and uh, it's really one of the highlights uh, of my role as uh, IPN director because I have some role in choosing the, the speakers that we, that we bring in, and so it's actually one, a lot of fun. All right, so. I want to make sure that Bernice shows up, so that's why I put that there, but we'll see. When it's her turn to speak, maybe I'll make myself smaller for now. I, I am, that's a good point. So, too many things to keep track of. Uh, it shouldn't be. Uh, so actually what's what's muted is that version of me so i think when Ber when bernice comes uh she'll she'll take over that window sorry about that it's complicated with with zoom like this but hopefully it'll all it'll all work out so uh to start out i just wanted to acknowledge a little bit the um the, the history and, and the support for this uh this event so um, this has been running since the time of Joe Rochford as director of IPN, and I, I just want to sort of make a shout out to Joe, um, who's not here today, just because, you know, he served for many years as IPN director, and he's actually retiring this year in January. So um, I just want to thank him for everything he's done over all the years and uh, acknowledge his role in creating this, um, this event. Also, the neurodevelopment office that helped work with Dr. Grafstein to create the um, the fund that allows us to do this every year, and in particular, Sandra McPherson and Sarah Stack in the office. And finally, uh, I really want to acknowledge the work that Adriana Scambetera has done. She's really uh, worked extremely hard to make sure that this was a successful event today, um, and I think uh, she deserves a lot of, a lot of uh, credit for, for making everything go so smoothly, so thanks to Adriana. And then finally, uh, we had a lot of help from the neuro, so Debbie Rashkowski and Marc-Andre Meloche who helped us set up the registration uh, system. So thanks to them. So this event, I'm gonna minimize this window back and forth. This event is the result of a very generous gift from Dr. Bernice Grafstein. Um, Bernice Grafstein is currently the professor of physiology and biophysics and Vincent and Brooke Astor distinguished professor in neuroscience at the Weill Cornell School of Medicine in New York. Bernice did her undergrad at the University of Toronto and importantly she came to McGill to do her PhD um, with uh, Ben Burns and actually Bernice's uh, work as a PhD student was extremely influential. She's really responsible during that time for explaining the phenomenon of spreading depression. And I always tell my undergrad students that, you know, when, when we talk about the Goldman Hodgkin Katz equation, don't worry about changes in concentration of ions. You know, it's just changes in the membrane voltage, concentrations of ions don't change much. And of course, Bernice is probably, you know, her hair's on fire right now. In fact, spreading depression is largely the result of uh, accumulation of extracellular potassium. And so um, the, a lot of our understanding of how this works comes from her work as a graduate student here at McGill. After working here, Bernice went on to have a really impressive career. She was recruited to the Rockefeller University, joined the, uh, the faculty of the Weill Cornell in 1969. Bernice's research includes, as I mentioned, understanding, explaining, spreading depression in cerebral cortex. Uh, she studied neuronal connectivity under Victor Hamburger, quite impressive at Washington University and at Woods Hole, where she picked up her initial uh, introduction to embryology, and then went on to do really important work on regeneration, both in the optic nerve and in, um, she did these supernumerary uh, limb uh, transplantation experiments that really gave us a an unusual understanding, not just of, of regeneration, but of, of I think importantly, um, neuronal transport. 
She discovered intracellular and transneuronal pr transport of proteins and neurons. Uh, you know, we talk about fast uh, anterograde and retrograde transport, and much of that is because of the work of Bernice. Um, my own, I, I, I say, I've said this before, my own uh, doctoral work was on uh, the formation of ocular dominance columns, and none of that work would have been possible without some of the methods that Bernice developed. Uh, Bernice has received numerous accolades over the years. Ah, the sound. <laughs> she probably didn't hear anything that I just said, so. Sorry, Bernice. The, uh, she's received the Society for Neuroscience. Oh, so, she, so first of all, she, she was the uh, president of the Society for Neuroscience in 1985, and quite impressively, the first female president of the society. Um, as a result, she's been very active in supporting, I mean, I would say female scientists, but scientists in general, especially um, educators and mentors, she received the, the Mika Cell Peter Lifetime Achievement Award in 2003. Um, Bernice was elected a member of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2021. She's a life trustee of the Grass Foundation, which the Grass Foundation has played an important role in her life. And she's, of course, played a very important role for them as a physiologist um, and, and an active member of the, of the foundation. And of course, she's received numerous other awards and prizes. Um, and so, this is an opportunity, I hope Bernice is able to, to hear me, to give her a chance to address the audience briefly and just um, uh, say hello and and, uh, and give you all some words of, of inspiration. Bernice, are you there? Can you hear me? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. I'm glad to be able to... I'm, I'm getting feedback, I think. I'm glad to be able to welcome you here today. It's very gratifying to know that there's so much interest in neuroscience nowadays, much more than when I was a graduate student here at McGill in the Department of Physiology. And for the students in particular, I want to welcome you uh, to uh, an important field in science that uh, that gives us the understanding of how we think and how we feel and how we act. And uh, so I, I welcome you and I uh, give you all good wishes for your future careers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So next, the introduction of today's speaker will be made by Barbara Barth, who's a PhD candidate in the lab of Patricia Silvera. Uh, Barbara, you can take the podium. So hi, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Mariana, Marina Picciotto, our speaker for the 2023 Bernice Grafting Lecture in Neuroscience. Dr. Picciotto is the Charles B.G. Murphy Professor in Psychiatry and Professor in the Child Study Center in the Departments of Neuroscience and Pharmacology at the Yale University School of Medicine. In September 2023, she was named the Director of the Yale University Interdepartmental Neuroscience Program. Dr. Picciotto was also Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Neuroscience until January 2023 and is the 23-24 president of the Society for Neuroscience. Dr. Picciotto received a bachelor's degree in biological science from Stanford University, a PhD in molecular neurobiology from the Rockefeller University under the guidance of Dr. Paul Gringard, and pursued a postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Jean-Pierre Changeau at the Institut Pasteur. Throughout her career, Dr. Picciotto has made significant contributions to our understanding of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in addiction, memory, and reward behaviors. And the goal of Dr. Picciotto's lab is to define the molecular mechanisms underlying complex behaviors related to psychiatric disorders. And to achieve this, her lab employs several techniques, including molecular genetics, biochemical, pharmacological, neuroanatomical, secret level and behavioral approaches to manipulate and characterize neurons and circuits important for the cholinergic signaling 
and reward. Dr. Picciotto's status as a leader in the field is not only evident by her research, but also by the many prestigious honors and awards that she has received throughout her career, including the Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering awarded her to her in 2000. And in 2012, she was elected to the National Academy of Medicine and the Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering. She's also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and was a chair of the neuroscience section from 2018 to 2019. Uh, Dr. Picciotto has been awarded the Jaco Waletsky Award for Addiction Research and the Bernice Grafton Mentorship Award from the Society for Neuroscience, among a multitude of other prizes and awards. So on behalf of all IPN students, I would like to express our gratitude to Dr. Uh, Picciotto for joining us today. And with no further ado, please join me in welcoming our esteemed speaker, Dr. Picciotto. Thank you so much for that introduction. That was lovely. Thank you. Um, let's see if I can get out of here. There we go. Go to here. And we'll share different screen. Nope, I'm going to share screen. Maybe this one. Yeah. See what happens. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here. It, it's been a pleasure to talk to all of you today. I've had a lot of um, really uh, fun and passionate discussions today, and I've learned a lot from from our discussions. I, I really appreciate the um, the really candid discussions that we've had today, particularly with the students. So thank you. You not good. Excellent. All right. Thank you. So. So I'm going to talk today, as you heard in the introduction, my, my interest is uh, really in the cholinergic system and how acetylcholine modulates um, neural circuits and behavior. We've started from the nicotine and nicotinic acetylcholine receptor side and gotten all the way to the other side to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, a really long journey across the synapse. But I'm actually going to talk to you today about a completely non-acetylcholine system. And I'm going to take you through some acetylcholine and nicotinic data in order to show you how we got there. But in the end, the, the discoveries that we made here are the result of a um, uh, first a postdoc, then a research, an associate research scientist in the lab who was uh, dogged in pursuit of um, interesting data and followed that data to where it led, which was not necessarily where we started. So I think it's a little bit of a, of a journey of serendipity, and I find that it's more exciting because it wasn't where we expected to start. So this is the perfect place to talk about how we um, think about reward and the pioneering studies of Olds and Milner. Of course, they were in another city in Canada we won't talk about. But indeed, the origin of the idea that the brain had dedicated circuits that were uh, devoted to encoding reward came from these um, experiments where if you put a, um, a, a, a stimulating electrode into the brain of a mammal, into the um, uh, medial forebrain bundle, and you stimulate, you, uh, and you allow the animal actually to work for that stimulation, the animal will continue to work for uh, delivery of uh, stimulation of that pathway in fact, to the detriment of adaptive behavior. And this has been shown in cats, it's been shown in monkeys, and it's been shown in rodents. And it led to the idea that the medial forebrain bundle, and particularly the um, pathway that goes from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens, was central to encoding reward and for experiencing reward. And this also then prefigured the dopamine hypothesis of reward. Now, the dopamine hypothesis of reward suggests that uh, without dopamine signaling, 
you uh, can't experience, for example, the rewarding aspects of addictive substances. And this really came about a lot in the 80s and 90s when there was an incredible upsurge in the use of cocaine, and particularly free-based cocaine, um, whereas the original uh, hypotheses around a reward were built around use of, for example, opiates. And opiates are pretty complicated, although we know their receptors, the three uh, classes of opioid receptors. Uh, their ability to stimulate um, the brain is quite complex, whereas psychostimulants, really pretty straightforward. Cocaine has a number of molecular targets, but the real primary target that uh, allows cocaine to be self-administered by rodents and almost certainly used by um, human subjects who, uh, who take cocaine involves blockade of the dopamine transporter, lengthening of the time that dopamine stays in the synapse, and therefore uh, prolonged signaling at its receptors. And because cocaine became, in fact, the uh, addictive substance of, of uh, greatest study during the time of the, the crack epidemics, it changed the entire paradigm of how we think about reward. Amphetamine also uh, really not as selective for the dopamine pathway, but reverses the dopamine transporter, blocks the, um, uh, the vesicular uh, um, monoamine transporter on uh, dopamine vesicles. So similarly, acts through increasing uh, the length of time that, uh, uh, that dopamine can signal in the synapse. So this dopamine hypothesis of, of reward has really dominated the addiction field for, for some time. And it uh, led to the idea that really what we use to uh, encode reward and to change our behaviors in order to seek rewards is the dopamine pathway. And again, there's the ventral tegmental area in the midbrain where the dopamine cell bodies for this ventral pathway involved in motivation and reward sit. And their projections forward in the brain, both to the nucleus accumbens and then to the prefrontal cortex. And this really does carry on uh, this, this idea that dopamine is essential for the addictive properties of substances abused by humans carries through across a, a number of addictive drugs that have different primary molecular mechanisms of action. So I've already talked to you about amphetamine blocking the vesicular uh, monoamine transporter, cocaine blocking the uh, plasma membrane dopamine uh, transporter, Nicotine, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are not exclusively on dopamine neurons, but they are on dopamine cell bodies and dopamine terminals. Opiate receptors are thought to be, although we'll see that this is not always the case, uh, largely GI coupled, so decrease excitability and are thought to act primarily on GABA neurons that impinge on these dopamine neurons or their terminals in order to disinhibit dopamine um, release. And so that what you see here in, in uh, a study of microdialysis is that if you put a microdialysis probe into the nucleus accumbens and look at the terminals of these dopamine neurons, look at dopamine release, all of these substances, despite their different molecular targets and despite the cell types on which those molecular targets are expressed, are able to systemically increase the release of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So this is all compatible with this dopamine hypothesis of reward, okay? So uh, in the um, late 90s, um, this idea that dopamine equals reward was so prevalent that we saw, for example, that dopamine was the molecule of the year for time. It was on the cover of Time magazine as the molecule of the year. You, any of you on social media, will see that people are out there hacking their dopamine systems. Uh, you know that in the, the public eye, dopamine equals reward. It's what we actually use to, to, to motivate our behavior. And so there were a number of uh, studies then in um, uh, monkeys by Wolfram Schultz and his colleagues that started to investigate this in, um, in a slightly different set of paradigms where uh, they gave monkeys an unexpected juice reward. And right in line with the dopamine hypothesis of reward, what you see here are uh, uh, neurons in the ventral tegmental area that have some tonic level of firing. The monkey gets an unexpected juice reward and boom, we see an increase in the firing of the, of the VTA neurons. Okay, we're good. We're still good with the dopamine hypothesis of reward. But what happened was that if um, Wolfram Schultz and his colleagues 
continued to do this same study, but instead of simply giving an unexpected juice reward, they cued that juice reward. So either there's a tone or there's a light that is reliably paired with that juice reward. The first time that you get that experience before they learn anything about it, you get the dopamine, uh, in, the increase in dopamine cell body activity at the time that the unexpected reward is delivered. But over time, what happens is that as the animals learn that the cue predicts the delivery of reward, the dopamine neuron firing moves back in time toward the predictor of reward and not to the reward itself. So instead, after these animals have learned, it is the prediction, the expectation of reward that makes these neurons fire, not the consumption of reward, where in fact, if the expectation is met, there's no change in neuronal firing. It's flat here. And here's the actual traces. Here's the cue. You get a burst in firing. Now they get the reward, nothing at all. And what happens when the animals get the cue and then the reward is omitted? Well, you're going along, you're expecting that reward. And instead, when the reward is not delivered, there's actually a dip in firing of these uh, uh, dopamine neurons, VTA neurons. And the idea that was then generated, again, was a paradigm shift. Instead of saying, ah, dopamine neurons encode reward, the idea is that instead, dopamine neurons encode an unexpected outcome that is rewarding. So if the unexpected outcome is, I didn't know that I was going to get to listen to this great lecture, then you'd get a burst of, of dopamine at the time you came into the room. But instead, if all of this week you've been looking at the seminar announcements and you've been looking at the prediction that this is going to happen, then if your prediction matches the outcome, once you're in this room, everything's flat. However, if your expectation is violated, then the dopamine neuron changes its firing again, in this case, dipping below, uh, below baseline because you've omitted the expected reward. And that's a signal to change your behavior. It's a plasticity signal. So rather than saying, okay, now the dopamine system is what tells us something is rewarding, the dopamine system is thought to be a prediction error system that is designed to tell you that I need to change my behavior because my expectation and my reality don't match, or they do match. So don't change your behavior. Okay, does that make sense? So this prediction error hypothesis um, really did change the field quite a bit. And a lot of systems now exhibit this kind of prediction error behavior, where initially a surprising result will cause activity in a number of neuronal firing, uh, a, a number of uh, neuronal, neuronal subtypes. And that over time, uh, a, a paired cue and expectation signal will actually uh, be the primary signal, because we don't know when the cue is being delivered. So that is still unexpected that's going to be the, um, the signal that uh, drives firing. So now I'm going to switch gears back briefly into uh, nicotine and nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, because that's where we started the story. And we knew at the time that we began the studies that we did on uh, individual nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, that the dopamine hypothesis was dominant in the field of addiction. And we were interested in figuring out how do nicotinic acetylcholine receptors influence the firing of dopamine neurons and how does that drive behaviors in our case in rodents but of course in humans who smoke um, to seek nicotine and what we knew uh, and these are experiments from uh, vta slices in mice was that if we could just spritz nicotine directly onto the cell bodies of dopamine neurons, and these were in uh, TTX, so no other inputs to these cell bodies could drive this neuronal firing, we saw in inward currents that were dose dependent when we put nicotine onto those cell, uh, dopamine cell bodies. So that's perfectly in line with the dopamine hypothesis. Here's an addictive substance, nicotine. If we put it onto dopamine cell bodies, we can increase uh, currents through those cell bodies. And if we put these neurons in current clamp, we can see that these neurons actually increase their smart firing rate, where each of these, excuse me, ticks is an action potential of a dopamine neuron. And if you put nicotine onto those slices, you get more action potentials, all in line. And we could even go down way down to 500 nanomolar nicotine, which is still high for the brain of a, a human smoker or vapor, but it's up there with a heavy smoker. We can see very clear increases in the firing rate of dopamine neurons. 
So we're still in line with sort of this dopamine reward hypothesis. And when we looked at how nicotinic receptors regulated the dopamine system, as I showed you, there are particular neuro, uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the dopamine neur neuron cell bodies, um, but there are also nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on their terminals here in the nucleus accumbens. And if you actually cut off these terminals and look at the ability of nicotine to release dopamine from the terminals alone, it's quite effective because there are nicotinic receptors that are active there as well. And if we look at the nicotinic receptor subtypes expressed in the ventral tegmental area, you can see that there are subtypes here, the alpha-6 and the beta-3 subtype, for example, that are highly selective for these catecholaminergic neurons. So what's really clear is that the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and the cholinergic input to the VTA has a highly um, uh, selective pathway from the, in fact, from the brainstem, uh, lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus and uh, RMTG forward to the ventral tegmental area. And this uh, mustache shape is actually here, the, in the middle you see the, the dopamine cell bodies of the ventral tegmental area, and this tail here are the dopamine cell bodies of the substantia nigra. And in addition to these very highly selective subtypes, we also have these very generally expressed subtypes. And you can see here, these are, uh, I should have said, in situ hybridization for nine different subtypes of the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. They assemble together into pentamers that are the receptors for both nicotine and acetylcholine. Uh, same site, actually, overlapping sites. So nicotine and acetylcholine are competitive um, uh, agonists at this site. And what you can see is that there's high expression of even these very widely expressed nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the ventral tegmental area. So what happens if we remove one of those subtypes of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor? What we did was to make a knockout mouse that only lost this particular subtype here, beta-2, which is required for assembly of these, all of these other subtypes pretty much. And if you can't assemble the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subtypes that are expressed here in the dopamine neurons. Now here are the same inward currents I showed you on the previous slide. These are slices from knockout mice lacking this particular nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunit. It's as if you spritzed water onto those cell bodies. If you don't assemble the, the heteromeric nicotinic receptors on the dopamine neurons, you don't get any dopamine, uh, any inward currents in uh, response to nicotine in these dopamine neurons. So we're good again. Same thing is true with firing rate. If you look at the firing of neurons that are wild type, you see this increase in firing, and you just don't see that if you knock out this particular subtype. So what this told us is we had a particular subunit that we could remove from the mouse. We could lose all of the regulation by nicotine and acetylcholine of those dopamine neurons through the nicotinic receptors. So this also translated into behavioral changes in these mice. We had a number of different assays where we tried to measure endophenotypes in the mice. We're not measuring addiction in mice. We're measuring behaviors that map in some ways onto constructs of behavior in humans who uh, take addictive substances. So cocaine and amphetamine and nicotine are all psychostimulants. What does that mean? They're arousing, they increase locomotion. Same is true in mice. If you give nicotine to a wild type mouse, you can see increases in activity. If you take away the one subunit that completely abolishes the ability to regulate the dopamine system, now you don't get that locomotor stimulation. And the same can be shown, for example, with cocaine when you um, are, uh, when you either mutate or knock out the dopamine transporter. It's a little complicated. I shouldn't go into that. Um, what else do we know about addiction, su addictive substances? We know that uh, people will seek them when they're in abstinence. So what we can do is we can use a, a behavioral assay called the place preference test, where we take animals that at baseline don't prefer either compartment of a two compartment chamber, but after training with nicotine three times in one chamber and saline three times in the other chamber, we can test them nicotine free and ask, where do you wanna spend more of your time? and wild type mice will spend more time in the chamber in which they got nicotine and less time in the chamber where they got saline. Okay, so that's a, a place preference assay, which suggests that they're seeking of uh, the environment that was paired with the drug. And again, if we knock out this sub subtype of nicotinic receptor, we lose that preference for a nicotine paired chamber. And finally, the gold standard for, uh, for addiction 
research in rodents, at least, is will an animal work to get infusions of the drug? And in general, all of the substances that are addictive in humans can actually be self-administered by rats and mice. And that's what you see here. What we do is we implant a jugular cannula into the mouse, and now the drug goes directly to the brain very rapidly, doesn't, uh, it stays high for a very short time, cleared very rapidly, and that's tied to a cue, and the animal will nose, nose poke to get infusions of that drug. In this test, we've actually trained the animals to uh, self-administer cocaine, and wild-type mice, when they're switched from cocaine to nicotine, will keep poking their nose, keep working for nicotine. If you switch nicotine for saline, the animals will extinguish their behavior. They stop looking for drug when they realize nothing's coming. But knockout mice lacking these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, when you switch them from cocaine to nicotine, they extinguish their behavior as if you switched it out for saline. So again, these are the hallmarks of reinforcement for drugs that are abused by humans or used uh, addictively in humans. So now I'm going to uh, talk about some data that um, are uh, really beautiful examples of the anatomical way that knockout mice that are constitutive throughout development in all tissues can actually be tested very locally. And these are experiments done by Uwe Mascos um, in, uh, in Jean-Pierre Changer's lab. And what he did was he took the complete knockout, lacks nicotinic receptors of this type throughout the brain and body, throughout all of development, and he put them back very selectively only here in the ventral tegmental area. So he used here a, uh, a, a nicotinic compound to show that these, this is the wild type pattern of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor assembly. In this particular knockout slice, what you can see is there's this one hot spot, the interpeduncular nucleus, because the, the uh, ligand that they're using here recognizes one other type of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor containing the beta-4 subunit, so that's there. And when he rescued, you see these sites of expression, he put in with a lentivirus, the cDNA encoding the beta-2 subunit into that knockout background, only rescued it here in adulthood. Those are the ventral tegmental area dopamine or ventral tegmental area cell bodies. And he then asked, does this rescue the behaviors that we know are gone uh, in the knockout? And sure enough, when he did a similar kind of self-administration experiment, he saw that wild type mice will go down a runway to get infusions of nicotine. Knockout mice won't do it, but if he just puts back in the beta-2 subunit into these, you know, into the VTA, now he can rescue that kind of uh, nicotine-seeking behavior. So this is really proof of concept. This isn't a, dis a, a developmental abnormality. This is not something that's happening throughout the brain. You only really need these nicotinic receptors in the VTA to rescue this, uh, this behavior. However, and this is, I think, really uh, fundamental. This mesolimbic system that goes from the ventral tegmental area forward in the brain is not just dopamine. And increasingly, there's some beautiful work from Maricela Morales looking at glutamate neurons that have their cell bodies here in the ventral tegmental area. They're also dopamine glutamate co-expressing neurons in the ventral tegmental area. And they are also projection neurons coming out of the VTA, some going to the same areas like the nucleus accumbens and the medial prefrontal cortex. But there's also, there were some um, very um, uh, uh, early neuroanatomical studies showing that there are also uh, GABAergic cell bodies in the ventral tegmental area that are more than just inhibitory interneurons. So in, generally the, in general, the thought was that all that GABA neurons do in the VTA is inhibit the dopamine neurons. They're there to sharpen the signal. They're there to damp down the uh, function of, of dopamine neurons when you don't need them. But instead, there were some early anatomical hints that there were actually some neurons that were projection neurons that left the VTA. And it turns out that these GABA neurons actually have a lot of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on them, including the subtype that I've been showing you is also on dopamine neurons. So if you look here, at, this is a very similar slice experiment that I showed you previously um, with the uh, wild type and knockout mice. But in this case, we're putting acetylcholine onto the GABAergic cell bodies in the VTA, and we're seeing very big inward currents. 
These are um, selective for uh, nicotinic receptors because we can block all the other acetylcholine receptors and we see these same very rapid currents. They're very rapidly desensitizing. Uh, they turn off for a long period of time after you put nicotine on the slice, but you can wash out the nicotine and get them back. So these are very similar to the types of receptors that we see on dopamine neurons. What do they do? So it turns out, and this is another set of experiments done um, in the Changeu lab, that if you, instead of rescuing the beta-2 subunit in those knockout mice in all of the VTA neurons, if you now have a selective viral construct that can pull out the receptors only on the dopamine neurons or only on the GABA neurons, to the surprise of these researchers, if you only rescue the nicotinic receptors on the dopamine neurons, you don't rescue the behavior. You don't rescue self-administration. You can get currents on the dopamine neurons. You don't get burst firing of the dopamine neurons. It's only when you also rescue the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the GABA neurons of the VTA that you rescue both the burst firing of the dopamine neurons and the self-administration behavior that you see here. So these are wild type mice in the clear circle, uh, in the dark circles. And if you rescue the beta-2 subunit in both the GABA and the dopamine neurons in the VTA, all of a sudden now it looks a little bit more wild type. Now that was actually very surprising. If dopamine neurons are sufficient for reward, why do we need these GABA neurons? And so in fact, this was the inspiration for starting to look at these GABAergic neurons in the VTA. We reasoned that this behavior was not because um, the, uh, the nicotinic receptors need to activate the GABAergic interneurons that should be regulating the network and downregulating dopamine activity, but maybe in fact what we're looking at here is the ability of the nicotinic receptors to regulate a completely separate class of uh, GABAergic neurons, and we started the process of trying to characterize those neurons. So when we look at the nicotinic regulation of the dopamine system, we actually know that there are nicotinic receptors on the terminals of these GABAergic interneurons. And in fact, Dan McGee's lab showed um, beautifully, Hyde Mansfelder and Dan McGee showed that you can get um, nicotinic receptor dependent GABA currents onto the, these dopamine cell bodies. And we're now proposing that you're also going to get activation of these projection neurons that may not in fact be impinging on the dopamine neurons locally at all. So first we had to do some tracing. First we had to see where are these GABA neurons that project going. So what you can see here, this is the ventral tegmental area. In purple here are the uh, GABAergic cell bodies. In green are the GABAergic cell bodies. So dopamine and GABA actually don't uh, overlap very much. These uh, medial cell bodies are the ones that are actually predominantly the GABAergic uh, projection neurons. And if you look at co-localization of uh, GAD, um, uh, GAD with a genetic marker and just immunocytic chemistry with a GAD antibody, you can see that they overlap quite well. So here's one neuron with the genetic marker that we're using to trace, and here's the uh, immunocytic chemistry. You can see that they look pretty similar. And if you look at this merge between the uh, GABAergic neurons and the dopaminergic neurons, they're not the same neurons. As, as far as we can tell, there's not a lot of overlap. There are not a lot of, there may be one or two uh, every once in a while, and that may be an artifact, we don't know. But for the most part, the GABA cell bodies and the dopamine cell bodies are separate. So where do they go? Um, and this is work by Seth Taylor. And what we found to, um, to our surprise, because we thought they'd just also go to the nucleus accumbens, that they'd be perfectly parallel with the dopamine neurons. They'd all be here in the nucleus accumbens. Remember, purple is dopamine, green is GABA. If we inject anterograde tracers into the VTA cell bodies and look for where those terminals go, very, very different. In fact, almost non-overlapping here in the uh, nucleus accumbens for the dopamine terminals and very, very bright GABAergic projection here to the ventral pallidum. And you can see some green here, and that actually is real. Um, there's been some very nice physiological studies by a number of labs on those, uh, those GABAergic projection neurons that go to the nucleus accumbens. However, you can see quite clearly they're just not as numerous and they're not as intense as these ventral pallidum neurons. So 
here's sort of our revised version. Why do we care about the ventral pallidum? Well, it turns out that the ventral pallidum is actually the common final common output of this whole basal ganglion ganglia circuit. When I showed you that dopamine centric brain, we showed the VTA as the center of the universe. We showed the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex as the main output structures. But in fact, if you know about basal ganglia physiology, the output of those medium spiny neurons in the nucleus accumbens, one of the um, primary nodes of that output is the ventral pallidum, and those are GABAergic projections, right? So the medium spiny neurons are the primary neurons from the nucleus accumbens, they're all GABAergic. They're going to the ventral pallidum. And now we have a projection directly from the ventral tegmental area, also GABAergic, that's going to the ventral pallidum. So what we have is two synapses, one that's dopaminergic and one that's GABAergic that's getting us here, and then one that's quite rapid that's going here to the ventral pallidum. What a great way to integrate the timing of information from the dopamine neurons to these medium spiny neurons and directly from VTA activity to the VP output. And so we started to test the idea that in fact, this might be relevant to reward processing. So as I mentioned, the ventral pallidum is the main output of the brain reward system. How do we know that it's actually involved in reward processing? Well, if you lesion the ventral pallidum, you don't get in rodents uh, behaviors relevant to reward and motivation. You can remove um, that sort of self-administration behavior. You can um, decrease place preference in others. If you activate the ventral pallidum directly, you can increase behaviors related to reward and motivation. So it's sufficient necessary and sufficient. And if you measure activity in the ventral pallidum, there's phasic bursts of excitation in these neurons that correspond to the presentation of hedonic stimuli, so both cues and primary rewards. So the activity of the, of the pathway tracks the uh, receipt of rewards as well. So very good reason to look at the ventral pallidum. And there's a lot of beautiful work now increasingly um, from Trisha Janak, from um, Megan Creed and others on the ventral pallidum itself and its role in reward related behavior. So the first question that was asked, and this is work that's been done by Wenliang Zhu, who was uh, started as a postdoc, now he's a staff scientist in the lab, was we saw an anatomical projection, but are these functional connections between the ventral uh, tegmental area and the ventral pallidum? So what he did was to use an anterograde tracer um, and a, uh, a herpes simplex virus uh, that he infused into the VTA. And this is a virus that encodes um, a tracer that jumps one synapse. And so if you inject this tracer into the VTA, you can see, um, uh, and it's also, sorry, Cree dependent. So we put it into the VTA of a mouse expressing Cree recombinase only in GAD positive neurons. So now, if you look downstream in the ventral pallidum, if there's a functional synapse, you'll see this marker postsynaptically in the neurons of the ventral pallidum, okay? So what he saw was, and we thought, okay, maybe there's a point-to-point -point connection between these, uh, these VTA GABA neurons and one specific neuronal subtype in the VP. Unfortunately, or fortunately, that's not at all what we saw. What instead that we saw was that if we look at the first, what we see is that in the um, uh, cell bodies of the ventral pallidum, we do see this marker, TD tomato, that's jumped a synapse. Those, some subset of those, uh, of those VP neurons express uh, GAD markers, some express cholinergic markers, and some express cam chemokinase 2, which at least in some cases is a glutamatergic marker. And if we look at the proportion of neurons that are connected from the VTA to the VP, it actually parallels the overall representation of these cells in the VP. So we have about 60% of the neurons that are um, GAD positive, that are um, uh, GABAergic. About 6% are CAMK2 positive, so some of those at least are glutamatergic, and about 4% are cholinergic, also mirroring what we saw. We 30% we could not identify for either technical reasons because they were below the threshold for any of these markers, or perhaps because they were subtypes that we um, can't characterize with the markers that we used. So there is point to point connection. It's functional. You can get labeling of synapses, but it's not selective. It's to all of the neuron neuronal types in the structure, and it's pretty broad. And that sort of looks, it, it's consistent with that very 
uh, strong innervation that you saw in the anterograde tracing study. So that's a, uh, a connection with, uh, with a tracer. Can we actually record currents that are GABAergic in these postsynaptic ventral pallidum neurons? What Wenliang did was to now, uh, again, use gad mice, but to put channel rhodopsin into the ventral tegmental area of those gad mice and then measure postsynaptic currents in cell bodies in the ventral pallidum. And luckily, because there were a whole lot of connections, you didn't have to search around too far to find cell bodies that had a postsynaptic GABAergic response. Um, and what he saw was that when he recorded, so let me show you some anatomy. These uh, green terminals, are the GABAergic terminals coming from the ventral tegmental area GABA neurons. Here is the ventral pallidum. You can see that they are uh, quite, uh, you see the boutons, right? This is the postsynaptic neuron that Wenliang recorded. So it's got its cell body and the ventral pallidum. Look at this merge. Look at how these GABAergic terminals are wrapping this entire cell body. <laughs> These GABAergic neurons are really in a position to regulate the activity of these VP neurons quite profoundly. And when he looked at the activity in these uh, cell bodies, what he saw um, uh, in general is that if he stimulated the, uh, sorry, if he uh, put light onto the, uh, onto the VP slice and he recorded the postsynaptic currents, uh, first, he could see a light induced current on its own. So it, the system was working if it would follow his pulses if he did a 20 hertz pulse, which is what he generally stimulated. Sorry, this is for the cell bodies as a proof of concept. But if he looked postsynaptically, what he saw is that every time he flashed light, he saw these GABAergic currents. Now, here is a technical um, just piece of information. He did these recordings in high chloride so that now both excitatory and inhibitory currents are inward currents. So each of these pulses could be an excitatory or inhibitory current. If he could block with GABAergic antagonists, then he knew they were inhibitory currents. And that's what he saw in most of the cases. You see beautiful currents that follow the light pulses, and they're blocked by picrotoxin, a GABAergic antagonist. All right, so he's getting functional connections between those VTA GABA neurons and postsynaptic cells in VP can watch out the picrotoxin. However, in some cases, when he blocked with picrotoxin, he only blocked part of that current. So probably about two thirds of that current. Instead, he had to add a glutamatergic antagonist to completely block these inward currents. And what does that mean? It means that when he flashed light on these uh, VTA GABA neuron, neuron terminals, in three out of about, uh, 25% of the time, he got co-release of GABA and glutamate. Now that's completely against the dogma that I grew up with in the field. So first of all, the dogma Dale's law is that every neuron has one neurotransmitter and one neurotransmitter only. We already know that that's not quite the case. Um, there was a lot of pushback, for example, against the idea that dopaminergic neurons could co-release GABA, uh, sorry, glutamate. So GABA, uh, I keep saying GABA because I want GABA. Co-release of dopamine and glutamate is now very well established and very well uh, 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 accepted. Increasingly, and this is not the first observation, there are also neurons, and in both of the cases that I know of, they are actually VTA neuronal subtypes, can co-release the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate with the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA. And for example, I think the first example of that um, were from both Maricela Morales and from Garrett Stuber, who stimulated VTA glutamate neurons, so expressing uh, markers of glutamate transmission in the lateral habenula and saw GABAergic responses as well as glutamatergic responses. So this is potentially uh, something that is a little bit more common that we think. What does it mean? Well, first of all, if the timing of release under normal conditions is different for the glutamate and GABA, it may be a way of very uh, tightly controlling the temporal uh, uh, firing of downstream neurons to a particular stimulus. So uh, this has not been done yet, but imagine that the glutamate uh, spikes are very fast and the GABA neurons have some small delay, then you are going to limit the uh, excitation in time very tightly. Uh, the other idea is that, in fact, uh, you will regulate the membrane potential of the neurons that are getting the glutamate and GABA 
uh, input and so that the next stimulus would have a very different response. But to be honest, we don't really know yet what this glutamate and GABA co-release um, is, is actually uh, doing functionally. But I want to point it out because I think it's a, a really interesting open question. Why would you have neurons that express both? Okay, it's a side note. So the next question that we had is, all right, we know that they're making connections. We know that they're releasing GABA and occasionally glutamate. Um, when are these neurons actually firing in a naturalistic context? If we do these reward-related behaviors and we measure the activity of these, um, uh, these GABA projection neurons out of the VTA, are they signaling reward? Are they showing prediction errors? Are they, what, what do they look like? And so what Kristen Kim did, um, she's a graduate student in the lab, was to use um, a G-CAMP, uh, a, a Cree-dependent G-CAMP, inject it into the ventral, ventral tegmental area, and then put a fiber over the ventral pallidum and measure the activity of uh, calcium entry into the terminals of those VTA GABA neurons. So you isolate them anatomically by having your fiber over the terminals and by injecting the virus into the VTA. And um, Kristen and Wen Liang had set up a battery of reward related behaviors to measure different aspects of responses for reward. Um, in, in the very simplest iteration, the animal has to poke its nose into a, a nose poke, which is where you poke your nose. And every time the animal pokes its nose into the nose poke, a reward is delivered into a, a receptacle, and the animal can go over and receive it. And we use Ensure, which I don't know if any of you have tried this. No? Vile, really vile <laughs> stuff. It is high calorie, high sugar, high fat. It's given to people who need to, to gain weight because of medical issues. So um, it's supposed to be really delicious. My students call it a milkshake. It's not a milkshake. Uh, but mice love it. And mice will work very hard for it. And um, if they drink a lot of it, will get all glossy and shiny. So it is a reward for them, and we can measure then the firing or the uh, calcium activity in these uh, GABAergic terminals as a result of this behavior. And the operant response, so the nose poke we can measure, and also the receipt of the reward. We also did condition reinforcement training, and this is where we start to teach the animals that a cue is going to predict whether or not they can get the reward. So in this case, they have to wait for a sound, when they poke their nose within the two second sound, then they get the reward. But if they poke outside of that cue, then they won't get the reward. So it's prediction, beginning to learn that the cue predicts the outcome. And so it's an association of that cue with the primary reward. And finally, or not finally, second to finally, uh, we did a test of whether the cue itself could uh, actually become a motivating um, uh, factor in driving behavior. So the idea in conditioned reinforcement is that if you pair a cue often enough with a reward outcome, then in fact, the cue itself becomes rewarding and you can learn a completely new task just for the cue. So no reward is, no primary reward is delivered. When animals poke their nose, they get the, or they will get the cue. They're poking their nose now for the cue. And finally, so there's that, they don't get insure, they get the cue. And finally, we wanted to know how motivated are they to get these rewards? And this is uh, a test called progressive ratio responding. So in the first instance, the animal pokes its nose once, it gets insure, and twice, three times, four times. And we look for how many times will they keep poking their nose just to get insure? Ridiculously lot of times, by the way. And we measure their breakpoints. When do you stop? And the amount of time it takes to get to that breakpoint. And the longer that you keep working for the reward, you, the more motivated you are for it, right? The more in some sense that that reward has value to the animal. And so first they get one, then two, and then a lot, and I finally they get the insure. And this measures both the operant behavior because they're poking their nose a lot of times and we can measure the response of this pathway to lots of unrewarded nose pokes and also to those that are rewarded and also to the outcome. Okay, so what do we see? Well, first of all, happily and interestingly, during that FR1 behavior where they're just, every time they poke their nose, no cue, nothing, they just get the reward, 
what we saw was an extremely nicely time-locked signal in these GABAergic terminals, time-locked to getting that reward, going into the receptacle and licking up that one uh, or five microliters of Ensure. And if they poked on the inactive nose poke and tried to get into the uh, receptacle, we saw no coordinated activity at all. It's very coordinated activity to the reward outcome. And if we taught them this task, that, or that is that they, they got very familiar with the task, they did it for half an hour every day for five days, what's really remarkable is there's absolutely no shift in this signal. They are getting the same intensity signal in response to receipt of the reward. They're not changing the timing of that signal to anticipatory before they poke their nose. This is a really highly stereotyped response. This is sort of blown out, but what you can see is that it's extremely time locked to the reward receipt, no activity, yes activity, and that the intensity, the area under the curve really doesn't vary, even though they're doing this boring task every day. Every time they get a new reward, they're like, yay, reward. My dopamine, my, <laughs> my GABA neurons are firing. All right, so now we checked to see whether if this is a signal that has something to do with reward, then a cue that has acquired some rewarding properties by being repeatedly paired with the uh, uh, outcome might actually uh, gain some uh, reward salience in this assay as well. So here's the same signal I showed you before in variant every time they get insure. Here's the signal when they just get the light that was previously paired many times with insure. We do actually get a signal when they work for the light, much smaller than the primary reward. There's no anticipatory response here to the operant response. Again, what it does look like is that if you're willing to work for that light cue, then it has acquired some of this physiological uh, activity as well. And we don't see that before training. But now I think the most interesting data are from the progressive ratio responding. So remember I told you that in the first five trials, they poke once, they poke twice, they poke up to five times, they get one dose of Ensure. By the last five trials, they may be poking 200 times just to get one Ensure delivery. And what you can see is that first, we never see any response to the nose poke. We don't see it on the rewarded or the unrewarded trials. We don't see any change in the magnitude of the response to ensure delivery on the first five trials or the last five trials. And this response is invariant, even though by, by now they've in, ingested maybe 20 doses or 100 doses of ensure. So the first, the last, the height of this peak is identical for these animals, and it only comes when they take the insurer out of the receptacle. This is a measure of them getting insure and not of all of the things that they had to do to get the insure or any predictors of getting that insure. So if it doesn't change over learning about FR1 responding, if it doesn't change over this progressive ratio responding, when does this signal change? Well, it turns out we can change this signal by changing the size of the reward or the duration of the reward. So what we did was to either, so all of the insure is <clears throat> in the data I showed you is diluted one to one. If it's not diluted at all, it's really gloppy and it's hard to get out of the, the spout. So all of this is one to one and the syringe pump goes for one second and that's the amount of insure that's delivered. So we can take the same dilution and we can deliver it for two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, and we interleave those trials randomly in a number of experiments. And what you can see is that depending on whether you get one second of insure, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, or five seconds, what you see over here is that for the most part, the height of the peak is the same because they're getting one-to-one -one insure for the first one second that's identical but the breadth of that peak lengthens depending on how long you deliver that insure. So here they're getting about five microliters versus one microliter, but the height's not going up. It's just the amount of time that this signal remains high. What if we, instead of delivering it for a longer period of time, dilute it? So we had a one-to-one -one dilution, that's our normal signal. What if we dilute it one to three, one to 10, one to 50? 
Now what we see is that the signal decreases depending on the dilution of insurers. So clearly this dilution is causing firing of this pathway quite potently. If we go down to one to three, not so much. One to 10, not getting a whole lot of signal. One to 50, we get much, much less signal. And in fact, the animals won't work very much for one to 50. We had to capture any of the events when they actually went in and drank that one to 50 because they don't really like it that much anymore. Perhaps because of this gamma breath, I don't know. But what you can see here is that if you actually quantitatively measure the area under the curve for all of the events for all of these animals, as you uh, go uh, higher and higher, or here, uh, less ensure more dilution, less signal in this pathway. And it's very clear now that the peak height is lower for the greater dilutions, um, and which it wasn't when you got the same dilution, but for a longer period of time. So what we see here is that in fact, perhaps what we're getting from these GABA neurons is actually a readout of how rewarding that primary stimulus is. We're not getting a readout of operant responding. We're not getting a readout of prediction. We're not getting a prediction error signal because it doesn't change in that progressive ratio when they don't get it. So they're poking their nose. They're not getting a dip at any point in this signal when they don't get the reward. Instead of getting a prediction error signal, we seem to be getting a signal that really scales with this reward, whether they expect it or not. So how does this compare to dopamine neurons? Well, I'm just showing you some unpublished data here, again, from Wen Liang. He did um, some fiber photometry work where he put um, the uh, dopamine sensor, grab DA, into the nucleus accumbens shell. And in this case, what he used as a rewarding stimulus is a peripheral injection of fentanyl. Fentanyl is an opioid drug that is highly addictive and highly rewarding. And what you can see is, yep, these dop there's a big increase in the dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens shell when you get this fentanyl signal. What about the dopamine cell bodies? You can put G-CAMP into uh, neurons that are expressing, um, so this is a, a Cree dependent G-CAMP into animals that have the dopamine transporter driving Cree. He put the G-CAMP into the ventral tegmental area. Beautiful firing of the cell bodies in the dopamine cell bodies parallels quite nicely the release of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. What about these GABA neurons? I will tell you before I show you this that the, in, the, the primary idea behind GABAergic um, signaling downstream of, uh, of opioids is that the GI coupled opioid receptors should decrease the firing of GABA neurons in the ventral tegmental area. What do you think we saw? No, no, ma'am. So if we put G-CAMP into the VTA GABA neurons in a GAD Cree mouse, it's a beautiful, very um, broad and long lasting signal to fentanyl that is um, clearly an effect of uh, the, the drug peripherally. Is this, it, there's no long delay. So it doesn't appear to be a, um, a, a signal that is downstream of many different synapses. We're still characterizing whether this is really cell autonomous. This is all in vivo, so we can't be sure, but it certainly looks like, in this case at least, fentanyl, the opioid, is increasing the activity of these medial GABA neurons that are probably mostly projection neurons. So more to come there, it's a teaser. So I've shown you when these neurons fire, what does this do to the ventral pallidum? Right? The whole idea is we're releasing this GABA into the ventral pallidum somewhat non-selectively onto all of these different neuronal subtypes. Can we see something about the network that changes when we stimulate this pathway? So what Wen Liang did was to devise a crazy, ridiculous experiment that I told him would never work, he should never do it, and of course he did it, and it's worked, and it's really interesting. So it's very hard to isolate this pathway um, without light because you have a whole lot of projections from the VTA to outside to the ventral pallidum. There's lots of different kinds of GABA neurons. So in order to isolate this particular pathway, what he had to do was to inject a retrograde flip recombinase into the ventral pallidum. So now he's only getting the terminals in the pallidum. 
Cre recom he, he had a GAD Cre mouse, so the Cre recombinase was only in GAD neurons, so we've got the cell type. And he put an anterograde uh, uh, dread that was both FLIP and Cre recombinase sensitive into the VTA. So only the neurons in which you have Cre, GAD, or in which you have projections to the VP, FLIP, will you get activation of this uh, chemogenetic activator of the circuit. And now what you can do is you can give the activator CNO peripherally and know that you are isolating these particular neurons. Then he had another virus. He put um, a G-camp virus into the ventral pallidum so he could follow the calcium activity in those postsynaptic VP neurons. And he put a lens, a, a, a deep uh, grin lens into the ventral pallidum and these animals have to be head fixed because the lens is actually um, the microscope is actually fixed and these animals now get to lick for sucrose or for water and we look at what happens to the activity of these vp neurons when they look for sucrose or water with or without stimulation of this vta to vp gaba pathway is that yeah good all right so what you see here is these are the um, cells in the vta the blue is tyrosine hydroxylase, the dopamine cell bodies. The red is the dread expressing cell bodies. You can see that they're not overlapping. So we're getting those VTA neurons that are not dopamine. And this is a view through the camera in the ventral pallidum of those G-camp expressing cell bodies. These are the ones that we're going to measure the activity of. This is proof of concept that if you take a slice through the VTA of animals that had all this happen, we can make those neurons fire with CNO. So there's a delay here after the CNO goes onto the slice, but now these neurons fire for a long period of time. So the chemogenetics works, targeting seems to work. So what happens? Well, I told you already that the reason that the VP is interesting is because we know that its activity seems to actually respond to consumption of rewards. And if you take all of the neuronal activity in the VP of unmanipulated animals and you coordinate them to licking for sucrose, what do you see? You see have a peak of the network activity here around the time that you either lick for water, these are water deprived, or you lick for, um, uh, sorry, you lick for sucrose, sorry. Same is true even if you give these animals CNO and you stimulate these VTA to VP GABA neurons, you still get a peak of activity around the time that these animals licked for sucrose. But what changes is the proportion of neurons in the ventral pallidum that are firing to the reward or for the licking before the reward. What you can see in red here is the proportion of uh, neurons that lick um, at the time that they're getting sucrose, that proportion of neurons that fire at the time that they're getting sucrose are in red. And here, what you can see is the proportion of neurons that fire when they're getting sucrose greater and much sharper. So both the activity during the licking to get the reward and the activity when they get the reward is greater when you stimulate this VTA to VP pathway. So in a sense, you are, we don't know fully how, but we know that we're increasing the number of neurons that respond to reward and we're sharpening the response of the structure as a whole to reward receipt. So we now know what it kind of does to the network. We know that uh, we can actually increase the enrollment of neurons in the VP in sort of responses to reward. What happens to behavior? So in this case, now what Wen Liang did was to use light activated um, channel rhodopsin to isolate this pathway during the same kinds of behaviors that I've already shown you during the fiber photometry. So these animals are uh, getting uh, the channel rhodopsin into the ventral tegmental area. It's Cree dependent, so they go into GAD Cree mice. The fiber goes over the ventral pallidum, and then Wen Liang stimulates these terminals during behavior in this FR1 task where they poke their nose for the reward, in the training where they get Q and then reward, in the test where they just get the Q to work for, and in the progressive ratio responding. There's the light. Okay. So what happens? Well, actually, we don't see much in FR1 training. If we just look at their ability to respond for a reward, they learn it very quickly. They're still doing just fine when we stimulate this pathway. However, if they have to learn that the light predicts the reward 
and we shine the light during the time when there's an overlap between the Q and their outcome, now we accelerate their ability to respond appropriately. So the light in some ways enhances this reward related behavior during the learning of a new task. We don't see much when we're asking them to respond for uh, the previously uh, paired cue. So if we ask, will you learn a new thing for the cue that has been predicting reward? In both cases, the control and the stimulated animals have the same behavior. So it doesn't seem to enhance the memory of that cue, or they may be at a ceiling. But in any case, we think it's happening during the behavior itself and not necessarily later on during the encoding of that behavior. But I think that's still, still, still to be asked. But where we see quite profound effects is in the motivation to keep working when they're not getting reward, but they're having to respond more and more and more. And in this paradigm, what Wen Liang did was to just stimulate every uh, few, I think it's every 10 seconds briefly throughout the entire period of the progressive ratio session, when they're getting fewer and fewer rewards for more and more nose pokes. And what you can see is on that first day when they're just getting it, there's actually not a lot of effect of stimulating throughout the uh, throughout the session. But if you do this on progressive uh, uh, if you do this progressive ratio test day after day, the animals that are uh, not stimulated, in some senses, tend to start to learn. Okay, I I'm not going to get this uh, this reward until I I do in this case you know 600 or so nose pokes. So they, over time, their breakpoint decreases. But if you continue to stimulate throughout the session, not only does their breakpoint stay high, it actually seems to increase as time goes on. It's as if, in some way, stimulating this pathway allows them to remain motivated to seek rewards even when the primary reward is absent. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to summarize. And um, I want to just sort of take you through what I just told you. Um, Going back to the dopamine hypothesis, like dopamine neurons, these VTA to VP GABA neurons do fire to that first presentation of a reward, to an unexpected reward. So there we have something that's quite similar. But unlike the dopamine neurons, we do not see any shift of the firing of these VTA to VP GABA neurons back toward a predictive cue. And we don't see a decrease or a dip in their firing, even when the animals know that a cue should, uh, or that, that an action should actually result in reward, the nose poke. Um, it is simply, um, uh, there's no em emission response. We simply get a response when the uh, reward does get delivered. We see that the firing of these neurons scales with the size of the reward or the duration of the reward. So it does seem to represent the magnitude of that reward. And then we can stimulate those neurons and we can see that it increases the number of ventral pallidum neurons that fire during the reward seeking, sharpens that response, and it can improve the learning of this Q reward task and prolong reward seeking over these five days of progressive ratio signaling. So why I think is this is important, yeah, this is just another circuit, right? Okay, great, there's lots of circuits. Why is this interesting? Well, if you think about reward prediction error, it's a formula. Right? The dopamine neurons tell you, predict a reward. If it comes, don't change your behavior. If it doesn't come, change your behavior. If that signal is the numerator of the equation, something has to be the denominator to tell you, yes, you did get a reward, or no, you did not. And so we would suggest that perhaps this inv somewhat invariant GABA signal that doesn't change much with learning, that just tells you, Yes, you got a reward and it was big or little, that might actually give you the denominator so that you can then use it to, to use to calculate your prediction error, which means that the contrast in firing between the two si systems and two signals could be very important for learning new behaviors. And so I wanna finish here by showing you both Wen Liang, who was the um, really the driving force behind this experiment and Kristen who did all of the fiber photometry this is my lab. Um, one of the first times we met uh, outside uh, after shutdown finished. I want to thank our funders, particularly the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, that has funded a lot of this lab, uh, a lot of this work. I want to thank Alex Kwan, who um, uh, in whose who basically analyzed the VP uh, single neuron data and who helped Wen Liang do it in his lab. 
And then uh, the Dyseroth lab uh, provided the Cree flip dread construct. Um, and you can follow me on X Twitter if you so choose, although I no longer engage quite so much. I want to thank you for what well, before I stop, I want to thank Dr. Grafstein. I want to thank her for um, pioneering beautiful work in neuroscience. We don't go into um, uh, into neuroscience in order to be a woman in neuroscience or in order to be the first X in neuroscience. We go in because we really want to find out something new. And that's something that she has exemplified throughout her career. And as such, I think continuing to have the excitement for neuroscience that she has to this day, she's an example to every single one of us. And she's an example that the love of science is something that can keep us going even when other uh, aspects of our lives and careers may try to get in the right way of that. And so I want to thank her and you for your attention. And I think we can maybe ask, answer questions. And I think we should be able to see if, if anyone on the Zoom would like to um, put any questions into the chat or the Q&A, please feel free. Great, OK. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so it seems like in VP <coughs> excuse me, uh, is where the signals are coming together. Right. So do you think that's where the key plasticity then happens? Because you know, so yeah. much of the work has been on the, the plasticity and the accompaniments. And much less on the, yeah. on the DP, but so have we been looking in the wrong place, basically? I'm not sure wrong place. Okay, I so think <laughs> I think the issue of um, VP plasticity is one that's really currently under uh, a pretty intense investigation. And, and, and some of the physiology that's being done now in VP, particularly from Tricia Janik, shows that there is indeed um, uh, synaptic, there are indeed synaptic changes in VP. And there's also some beautiful work on um, the, um, the, the hot spots, the hedonic hot spots in the VP, which may in fact uh, express a lot more of the mu opioid receptor. And the idea that there's archipalatal versus uh, see, archipalatal and the other palatal uh, projections within VP that encode different aspects of the reward signal. Um, and that there may be differential plasticity in those different subpopulations of neurons in the VP. I think it's very exciting. And I think we're really just beginning to pull that apart. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about if you have any thoughts on how oxytocin might fit mm. in this picture in terms of what you described at the end about the kind of <clears throat> and then um, because um, dopamine and oxytocin have been shown in pair bonding to be working like in concert. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic question because we, you know, I'm, I've been presenting this as if reward was this unitary thing. And of course, there are very many different kinds of reward. There's the reward that comes from affiliation. There's the reward that comes from consumption. There's the reward that comes from um, uh, completion of difficult tasks and terminating that task. And each of those may be very different. There's some beautiful work on um, oxytocin dopamine signaling, as you've mentioned, in the nucleus accumbens. Um, I, I know of nothing uh that doesn't mean anything i don't know personally of studies in the ventral pallidum but i think it'd be very interesting to look at that and whether these gabergic pathways are intervening in the already known dopamine oxytocin pathways that would be a really interesting um, area of study but to be honest i don't know uh, of any data around that yet great question though on that. sure so in terms of the ventral pallidum so my introduction was thinking about yeah yeah. We don't know what they are. Could they be? The, so yeah. The yeah. So my guess for those is that they are um, peptidergic of many different kinds. And what proportion of those are VP1 positive? I don't know. Um, and I think that's uh, something that could be done. So, you know, there's increasing numbers of single cell um, transcriptomics uh, studies that we can mine out there. Um, for each different uh, uh, brain area so that we can actually figure out the proportions of neurons of different, um, of different phenotypes. And we can see, I mean, we know that all of them are going to have GABA receptors. 
doesn't tell us that they're necessarily connected to these GABAergic um, uh, VTA neurons. Um, but I, um, I am still in the dark as to what those 30% uh, are, 40% are. Yeah. Will the animals stop learning? Right. And uh, a follow through with this one is that back in the days, in the region, that concept of one thing versus liking. Yes. And so, if we, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. those neurons actually, it's more about the conditioning, they don't want me to learn something, or it's more about the, the physiological response yeah. to this work. So, this is, you're now channeling Wen Liang, and every time we talk, we talk about two different things. One is goal tracking and sign tracking. He thinks these are goal tracking neurons versus sign tracking neurons. I think he's probably right, although it's very, very difficult to do that in mice. And the other question is wanting versus liking. And um, my guess would be these would be liking neurons rather than wanting neurons. Um, I think that we don't have the paradigm set up in mice to test that yet, but that's exactly what Wen Liang is trying to sort of uh, work out now. In terms of the silencing, um, our challenge at the time was making sure that we silenced enough of these neurons selectively that we actually um, shut down the signal sufficiently because the um, projection in the VP is so broad. Doing that with light was not going to um, be, I think, sufficient, so we didn't start with that. Um, I think we'd have to silence in the VTA and we'd have to do it with the retrograde. Um, and so that is something that Kristen wants to do. And so it is on the list and has not yet been completed for technical reasons. Yeah. That was a beautiful talk. Thank you. Can we hire Ryan again? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I will ask him. <laughs> He's technically amazing. And all he wants to do is actually get data. So, yeah. I'll tell him. Yeah, uh, or a, uh, only a subset, about um, 25 percent. So I'm wondering if some of the um, behavior actually 30 percent and some of the activating mm -hmm. effects in the host could be glutamate. Neurons, yeah, mm -hmm. can you disentangle how much of that is glutamate? Is it simply as yeah. is it a gas pedal break effect and actually most of the excitatory effect is glutamate? Fabulous question, and I wonder exactly the same thing. We have not done any experiments to address that yet, but the person who's been doing beautiful experiments in that way is Maricela Morales, where she has, let me get it right, she's either, I think what she's done is in the dopamine neurons that are co-releasing glutamate, she has inactivated the um, uh, glutamate, uh, vesicular glutamate transporter. So what she's been able to do is to, it's either that or the other way around, inactivated dopamine release in the co-releasing uh, neurons, but the same idea, and she wants to do it both ways, so that you don't kill the neuron, you don't silence the neuron, you simply take out the co-transmitter and ask, if you now stimulate that pathway, do you change the phenotype? I think she is not yet at the point where she has um, full behavioral data, but it does look like um, she's getting a behavioral consequence of doing that selective manipulation. So in order to get at that question here, we would have to do the equivalent experiment. And I think that's one of many on the list, but it's exactly, uh, I think that's exactly the right question, especially in the network. Why do we actually get the sharpening and the increase in enrollment of neurons um, in response to reward? Maybe the excitation rather than inhibition, although you can imagine sort of since um, such a large proportion of the neurons in the VP are GABAergic, it could in fact be a consequence of primarily shutting down the GABAergic uh, transmission within the structure, but um, great question. Other questions? I was working my way uh, right to left, so anybody over here? Yeah. Yeah, another great question. I think we would still see firing. Um, we've done um, 
one, I think, very piloty experiment just to see if um, saccharin would do it. And we did see, we didn't do an extensive experiment, but it did look like there was a signal. I think there was some kind of palatability reward there. Um, I think it's probably not going to be as intense as this uh, combination sensory and systemic reward. The high calorie and the high um, nutritive value, I'm sure, is also rewarding. Um, beautiful work from uh, Ivan Lalmand on um, the reward that comes from nutrients delivered past your sensory system. Um, you can see dopamine signals, for example. Um, sorry, not Ivan Lal uh, Lalmand. That was the person who taught me how to, I talked about him earlier. He taught me how to do knockout mice. Uh, uh, Ivan Darojo. Sorry, my bad. He's here, or he was here briefly. He was at McGill for a little bit. All right. Thank you. So uh, I, I regret to say we don't have any insurer, but we do have <laughs> wine and cheese as a, as a reward. So uh, I mean, that's please join us outside. Right? Yeah. It's Thank you, Bernice.